the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Anarcho Judaism and the Thought of Avraham Chain by Chaim Rothman. In one of his lesser known autobiographical vignettes, Tata Vert an Anarchist, Daddy Becomes an Anarchist, Isaac Bishop a singer recounts how, with blue eyes and fiery red beard glowing, his father returned one day from Warsaw's Radzimin or Stiebel, a small synagogue, with news of a group whose members call themselves anarchists. He recalls how, till late in the night, his father described the happy times to come when there would be no need for money and everyone would work and study Torah, concluding that though Jews long for the Messiah, while we're in exile, it would be quite a good thing. Yet, he reports, his father's ardor waned once he heard that their entire philosophy was incompatible with Judaism. Rabbi Singer's career as a religious anarchist was thus aborted before it began. One wonders, however, what might have been had the impressionable rabbi not rushed home, but after leaving the Stiebel on Franziskanska Street and crossing through Kresinski Garden on the way to Krachmalna Street, instead tarried at the Jewish library next to the Great Synagogue. If we consider the Warsaw of Eliezer Hirschauge's memory, he may have bumped into Aaron Pinchas Gross, known among the anarchist underground by his alias Der Alter, who, with a thick sitter of machzer, prayer books, and a prayer shawl under arm, would have been making his way to synagogue with a lively step. He may have come across more than a minion, a prayer quorum of God-seeking youth studying anarchist texts. He may have even heard of one of the revolutionary sermons that were more abundant than flowers, and thus learned of the religious mystical views that drove others to make human life more just and the earth a bit more heavenly. Perhaps he would have persisted in the face of skepticism. Perhaps the story would have ended differently. So far as Rabbi Singer himself is concerned, one can do more than wonder. But this vignette confronts us with more fruitful threads of inquiry. Most classical anarchists were notoriously anti-religious and militantly atheist. The Jewish standard bearers, men like Joseph Boschover, characterized anarchism as a world in which churches and synagogues become stables, a world of knowledge and not of faith. Beyond neglecting tradition, they gleefully trampled it underfoot. That Rabbi Singer could have ambled over to Telemachi Street and encountered what Hershaga describes, a circle not simply of Jewish but religious Jewish anarchists, demonstrates that the story of Jewish anarchism and Jewish radicalism in general is in fact far more complex. In this broadcast, I will first review the historical and theological background of Jewish anarchist thought, and then proceed to examine major themes in the writings of one of its primary proponents, namely that of Rabbi Avraham Yehuda Chain. It is well known that the 19th century was for Jews in the Russian Empire a time of great turmoil and even greater suffering. Repeated failure to ethnically cleanse imperial Russia of its Jewish population led to the 1791 creation of the so-called Pale of Settlement, to which almost all Russian Jewish residency and movement was restricted until 1917. During this period of confinement, Russian Jewry was subjected to what Simon Dobnov called a century-long administrative pogrom a brutal and lengthy process of social and political engineering functioning as a thinly veiled endeavor to destroy it both spiritually and materially. This policy of forced assimilation was not entirely one-sided. In the naive and utterly unfounded belief that Russian authorities sincerely wished to improve the Jewish condition and the spirit of humanistic values, proponents of the Jewish Enlightenment, or Maskilim, 
often became unwitting allies and agents of an oppressive government seeking to leverage ostensive reform for other ends, namely the elimination of a class of people deemed parasitic on account of their distinct collective identity. For this reason, Maskelim were deeply distrusted by the Jewish masses. During the 1870s, the shades began to fall as wave after wave of astonishingly violent pogroms fell upon Jewish communities throughout the Pale, attacks that were tacitly supported by the imperial government, which responded not by holding perpetrators responsible, but by punishing their victims and tightening already crippling restrictions on them. Realizing the impossibility of merging with, with a people that, as Dubnov put it, appeared in the shape of a monster, disillusioned assimilationists returned to the fold, laying the groundwork for modern Jewish nationalism. This shift had enormous repercussions for a, for a new Jewish politics characterized by agency and active resistance. Most important for our purposes here, it gave rise to modern Jewish nationalism. As far as we are concerned, this involves the basic principle that Jews constitute a collective which, which possesses religion but is not reducible to it. Decoupling Jewish identity and Jewish religion, Jewish nationalism created an intermediate region between orthodoxy and assimilation, an amorphous center that facilitated a Jewish cultural renaissance in Eastern Europe that included, especially on the fringes of the orthodox world, creative re-engagement with core religious questions. These trends converged in Chibat Zion a proto-Zionist movement that stood for Jewish national and cultural renaissance and believed that this would be accomplished through the construction of a spiritual center in the ancient Jewish homeland. Jewish religious anarchism took shape as an offshoot of the Chibat Zion movement. Post-Enlightenment Jewish nationalists were profoundly inspired by Russian populist socialism or Naradism, among other things by its notion of Sobornost, the spiritual unity and spontaneous order achieved within living communities, and its valorization of the obshina, the self-governing agrarian commune. The former influenced modern notions of Jewish peoplehood, the latter gave rise to the moshav and the kibbutz, the Jewish collective settlement. Russian anarchism had deep and neurotic roots that never thoroughly cut. Peter Kopotkin, Mikhail Bakunin, and Leo Tolstoy, for instance, all to a greater or lesser extent operated within a Narodnik frame. Jewish religious anarchism grew in a similarly organic manner from Chibat Zion, nationally draw naturally drawing from their Russian counterparts. anarcho Narodnik sources were especially attractive to religiously inclined Jews. Although obviously written in a Christian idiom, Tolstoy's anarchism was explicitly religious in character and inspired several Jewish iterations, the writing of the aforementioned Avraham Chain being one example. His authority, moreover, lent weight to their efforts to synthesize religious authenticity with political radicalism. God-seekers of the Solovyev circle, which included Christian anarchists like Nikolai Berdayev, drew heavily on Kabbalistic sources in the course of their efforts to embed Friedrich Schelling's philosophy in its Neoplatonic sources and thereby link it to Rus Russian Orthodox theology. In a more general sense, anarcho neurotinism and other non-Marxist utopian socialisms appealed to religiously inclined Jewish radicals because, idealist in, or in orientation, they represented an alternative to the prevailing materialism, which they took to be incompatible with faith or morality for that matter. While the habit of tracing anarchist tendencies through pre-modern sources runs the risk of anachronism, neglect of these sources and their impact means failing to grasp the intellectual and spiritual content that informed the modern movement, especially in its Jewish expression. A number of themes persisted in Jewish religious literature that provided source material for anarchists attempting to articulate a radically egalitarian vision. Among them, the prophetic vision of social justice and its messianic culmination, the idea of the messianic abrogation of the law, the imperative to neighborly love, and anti-authoritarianism. As a basis for discussing the work of Avraham Chayin, we will consider only the latter two. In Talmudic literature, we find two accounts of the command to love your fellow as yourself. Rabbi Akiva called it a great general rule in, in the Torah. 
while Hillel the Elder described it as the entire Torah. As Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Grand Rabbi of Lubavitch, has explained, the first account implies that the Torah circumscribes and limits love, while the second implies that love circumscribes the Torah. Elsewhere, the embeddedness of the Torah in the imperative to neighborly love is coupled with the love of God. Rabbi Simlai taught concerning the Torah that its beginning is an act of kindness and its end is an act of kindness. He also taught that the prophet Amos reduced the whole Torah to one principle, as it is stated, so says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. For Rabbi Simlai, the Torah is contained within works of love to Toward, and toward other people and stands on the love of God. This synthesis, love of man and love of God, entered Christian tradition through the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus taught that all the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. And its Christian iteration re-entered Jewish religious consciousness through Tolstoy's theolo theological writings. The nature of authority and the legitimacy of its exercise is a topic that concerned biblical, biblical authors from the first chapter of Genesis forward. On the one hand, humankind is granted dominion over the natural world. On the other hand, human caprice is limited by God's command. Man is bidden to abstain from the tree of knowledge. While yet they heeded God's word, man and, and woman were one flesh undifferentiated and so necessarily equal. Neglecting it, and thus rebelling against the divine sovereign, one came to rule over the other. Regarded from this vantage, the Torah announces at the outset a clear political message. When divine sovereignty is abrogated, human sovereignty sets in. Arguably, the remainder of Genesis and the majority of the book of Exodus constitute a commentary on this single theme. God favors Abel's pastoralism over Cain's agriculture and the hierarchical urban civilization it fed. Civilizations represented by Babel, which God destroys. God chooses Abraham, an isolated wanderer. Reciprocally, Avraham refuses sovereignty when it is offered to him by the Sodomites after the War of the Five Kings. His family's woes begin when their wandering comes to an end in Goshen in the land of Egypt, and they assimilate into a civilized nation led by a tyrant who enslaves them. The subsequent exodus is in essence a story about rebuke and restoration. God rebukes the pharaonic system and reestablishes divine sovereignty in a desolate land where, polit well, where political idols cannot grow. This ideal appears throughout the book of Judges. For instance, in Jotham's parable of the trees, which went forth to anoint a king and found none but the despicable thorn bush, which threatened them with a conflagration should they withhold the crown. And especially in Samuel's rebuke of the Israelite demand for a monarch. While the Bible is hardly monolithic in its rejection of centralized human authority, its egalitarian tendencies remain throughout a persistent counterbalance to the consolidation and, legit and legitimation of the ancient monarchy. This tension was carried over into rabbinic literature, with, which left open a question as to whether Jews are, under the right circumstances, commanded to appoint a king or merely permitted to do so and advised not to. While theological concepts, tracing back to antiquity and developed over the course of two millennia, were not expressions of anarchism before the fact, I contend that each generation interprets the traditions it receives in keeping with its own distinct character. Recurrent anti-authoritarian and egalitarian themes came to express an anarchist ethos in the intellectual milieu of the late 19th century Russia, suffused with populism, utopian socialism, and anarchism. Having discussed the historical and theological background of Jewish anarchism in the late 19th century, we'll now move on to consider the thought of Rabbi Avraham Yehuda Chain. Avraham Yehuda Chain lived from 1880 until 1957. He was born in the Ukrainian city of Chernigov into a prominent Chabad Hasidic rabbinic family. After obtaining private ordination, he assumed several rabbinic posts throughout Eastern Europe. Actively working to support Jewish religious life after the 1917 revolution, he was eventually forced to flee Bolshevik per persecution two years later. Migrating westward and continuing to serve in a series of rabbinic roles, he finally left Europe with the Nazi rise to power 
settling in Jerusalem in the mid-1930s, where he became a popular public intellectual and headed the Religious Affairs Department of the Jewish Agency. Chin's teachings are mainly found in his three-volume opus, B'machuta Yahadut, in the Kingdom of Judaism, which was mostly edited during his lifetime, but posthumously published between 1958 and 1970. Intended to evoke Tolstoy's Kingdom of God, the work strongly reflects this influence. This collection of previously published essays served to shape a systematic account of Jewish nonviolence and anarcho-pacifism. Here, we will observe Chin's belief that the absolute sanctity of human individuals constitutes the essential message of Judaism and frames his anarchism. Chin's thought began with the Sixth Commandment. Against the grain of rabbinic consensus, Chin interpreted it not as a prohibition against murder, but against taking human life in any form. Explicitly drawing on Tolstoy's essay, Thou Shalt Not Kill, he distinguishes the sense of, Torah, of the Torah's command from what he describes as Roman and anarcho-individualist moral notions. According to the Roman or statist sense that Chen often describes to European civilization as a whole, the individual is regarded as nothing but a tool of the community for the sake of which he can be sacrificed. Accordingly, killing is sanctified when it serves the public good and condemned only when the public good is harmed by it. As Chen put it, where the whole discerns that it requires someone's blood, or blood in general, his blood is shed like that of an ox or a goat. Moreover, this slaughter is sanctified. The life and being of the one is nothing more than a footstool for the life and prosperity of the many. Here, the sixth commandment loses its radical moral sense and becomes a function of public order. In stark contrast, the anarcho-individualist anarcho denies the right of the collective over the individual. If the individual is everything, and his destruction is the destruction of everything, for the sake of what, Chen asks, could he be sacrificed? A fine conclusion in itself, but one with troubling consequences. An utterly sovereign individual is not constrained by anything, including the prohibition of murder. Acknowledging what he takes to be Kropotkin's response to this difficulty, that this rule constitutes sound advice, for your neighbor will permit your blood if you permit his, it falls away when one is forced to choose between slaying or being slain. Kropotkin's rationale, as Chen understood it, supposes that one's own life takes precedence such that the prohibition of murder is not unqualified. In contrast, Chen argued, the Torah asks, who says your blood is redder? and obligates self-sacrifice. This implies, so he explained, that human life is sacred and that uprooting it for any reason is sinful. Their prohibition of murder is without conditions. This, he taught, is not something inscribed on the tablets of the law, but the tablets themselves, the essence of Jewish religion, its starting point, the fundamental foundation of its soul. To deny it, Chena Verd, is not simply to deny the foundations of the Torah, but to become a murderer in potential. Drawing on a theological tradition with the roots in Maimonides, Chin grounded this sanctity in the distinction between notions of oneness and uniqueness. According to Maimonides, one means one among many, whereas the unique is the only one. Maimonides restricted this notion to God, representing this distinct distinction as an opposition between qualitative value and quantitative value, Chen extended it to human beings. Human life is sacred, that is, unique. Thinking along roughly Kantian lines, he appealed to the census taboo found in biblical and rabbinic literature, which he interpreted as a prohibition against quantifying people. A person, Chen contended, is not merely a means to an end, but an end unto itself. Neither an object nor property, the individual is not one, but qualitatively unique, an absolute essence. Expressing the same notion in distinctly liturgical, liturgical language, Chen wrote that each individual bears the aspect of being, that is, of God, such that there is nothing other than him. In the Hebrew of the Elenu prayer, Ephes Zulato, the world exists for him, and he does not exist for the sake of the world. Or as the Talmudic rabbis put it, when a single life is destroyed, it is as if 
it is as if the whole world was destroyed. From the sanctity, uniqueness, and absolute value of human life, Chen derived two basic principles. One, that where people are concerned, ends never justify means. That is, he upholds a strict doctrine of ends means correspondence. Two, that the individual is irreducible to the collective, the latter being nothing more than an aggregate viewed from without. People, he wrote, are not like drops of water that can be stirred together so that in the end they become a single entity. In distinguishing between the one and the unique, we saw that a subject is valued qualitatively, while an object, property, is valued quantitatively. The latter serving as a means to an end, the former existing only for itself as an absolute value. The term chen used to denote ownership was balut, which also suggests dominion. This implies that the sanctity of human life also means that people cannot be ruled, hence the foundation of chen's anarchism. Human blood, he wrote, is the universal currency with which everything is purchased, islands, colonies, markets, and so on. On this foundation, there is no difference between one government and the next. Government means compulsion, and compulsion means blood. It lives on blood. It is along these lines that Chain interpreted the phrase in Exodus, If you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it of hewn stones, for by wielding your tool upon them, you have profaned them. As explained in the Mishnah, iron was created to shorten human life and the altar to extend it. The two are incompatible. So Chain elaborated, state institutions and states themselves are built primarily on blood and by the sword. That which is fashioned from blood and drips with it above all cannot become an altar. They are essentially profane, standing in violent contradiction to the Jewish ethos. Thus, Chen contended, sacrificing the individual for the sake of the collective originates from a prior doctrine, that of dividing the inhabitants of the world into masters and slaves. Appealing to an incident recorded, in Kropotkin's memoirs, in which the author recounts how his grandfather earned a medal of courage for saving someone from a fire by sending his serf to do it, Chen notes that for the master, his men were nothing more than objects, not humans, but carriers of determinate value that may be shattered at will, like any other tool. In the course of generations, Chen went on to explain, there have been subordination to kings, flags, parties, states, and so on. There has even been a forgery of man himself, whereby he sends himself to death, to destruction, by members of a parliament he has chosen from among his own. Thus, the form of slavery has changed, but the foundation remains, and external authority hovers above. There is always someone who climbs the mountain and sends those who stand at its base to war. Whether he climbs in purity or impurity, he sends. He sends because he is the master. They are sent because they are under his authority and not their own, because they are slaves. According to Chen, this insight constitutes the cornerstone of the great city of anarchism, namely the, t the total negation of servitude and authority of one man over another. The most radical implications of this negation appear in Chen's attempt to apply it to the Jewish legal tradition. On the one hand, he held that man is naturally a social animal that cannot thrive in the fullest sense outside of the community. Nonetheless, like the air that they live by but not for, people exist for themselves and the community has no claim over the sovereign authority of the individual. Hostility to authority is thus tempered by responsibility and belonging. This aspect of Chen's thought appears in reflections on the revelation at Sinai as described in rabbinic interpretation of the verse, the people took their places below the mountain, which is from Exodus. Taking the word below literally, one Talmudic rabbi suggested that the mountain was suspended overhead and the people were to be crushed beneath it unless they accepted the Torah. Another counted, countered, that this would constitute a substantial objection to the legitimacy of the Torah. In this retort, Chen discerned a radical formulation of the principle of freedom of choice. Judaism, he wrote, 
is literally inconceivable without the principle of free choice, which is an outgrowth of the right of existence, and so the immediate consequence of absolute justice that Judaism demands. Since, he continued, it is not a gift or kindness, but comes only from itself, no stipulation, no limit, no boundary can be imposed on it from without. The measure of freedom in the Torah of Israel, he explained, is therefore truly unlimited. As he writes, No authority external to the individual can compel him and rule over his freedom. Only he himself may compel himself. If you erase this point, the point of being, its holiness and its right from our faith, then you render its substance a forgery. Our special substance is the idea of beating swords into plowshares, the pulverization of the gods of power, compulsion, and the altars of man. While freedom of choice typically appears as a problem in metaphysical discussions of divine omniscience, Chain transforms it into a moral and political obligation unto itself. People must be treated as free agents and never compelled, not by God and not by man, this being the very essence of the Torah. Chain interpreted the suspension of Mount Sinai in the aforementioned anecdote accordingly. He argued that the image of the hovering mountain signifies not external compulsion, but a different sort of authority, namely an inward sense of responsibility to ancestral tradition. It is only that such loyalty must come from within and cannot be compelled. In other words, he does not dismiss obligation and responsibility, rather he maintains that these must come from inner conviction. This balance between freedom and responsibility extended to Chayn's approach to Jewish law and its interpretation. He relied on three basic principles to supply him with the flexibility he needed. The first and most important was a rabbinic claim to the effect that basic principles of the Torah are like mountains hanging by hairs. That is, without firm or definite scriptural ground. So he explained, There are no general principles or signs to recognize the inner substance. It is something sensed by the one who feels it, it is a matter of intuition, the intuition of the heart. There is being and essence in a book. There is that which is written and that which is not written, the point and substance, time and eternity. Only a special sense, a unique palette, a definite intuition is able to divine the true aspect of the matter. The people who cultivate their palette by immersing themselves in the Torah, thereby gaining an intimate, intuitive sense of its true meaning. They become Sinai, as it were. They immerse themselves in the wells of creation, Chain writes, and become so saturated with them that they become one with them. In Psalms we read, The Torah of the Lord is his desire, and in his Torah he meditates. On Chain's interpretation, at first it is the Torah of the Lord, and afterwards it becomes his own. As Chain understood it, becoming Sinai gives license to innovate, to create new Torah, it also frees him to eliminate or to circumnavigate aspects of the Torah such as it is received which come to contradict its spirit. One who is able to tie crowns for every letter of the Torah, like Rabbi Akiva, Chain writes, is also able to uproot its mountains. That is, a person like Rabbi Akiva, who is said to have interpreted the Torah so finely as to make meaning of its scribal embellishments, is also a person who can transcend its word in the name of something higher. Here, we see that the tension between freedom and responsibility is mediated by the right to interpret. As Chain writes, the true meaning of the book is the way it is read, not the way it is written, that which is absorbed in the tablet of the heart and not that which is cast like a golden statue or hewn like a marble idol. In this sense, Chin distinguished between the Torah as given at Sinai and as taken from Sinai. The recipient of the given Torah is subject to it and lacks authority over it, but also responsibility for it. The one who takes the Torah from Sinai bears both authority and also responsibility. In sum, we find that Chin sees in the uniqueness of the individual his or her exclusive authority over themselves. Dominion, he contends, is just another form of ownership and therefore degrades the divine in man. Consequently, he rejects the form of state in which one person rules over another. Yet, he embraces the internal sense of responsibility that motivates individuals to adhere to beneficial communal norms. <laughs>
This he explores within the framework of the revelation at Sinai, in which freedom and responsibility are mediated through a process of interpretation that continues on through generations. The interpreter heeds tradition, but is not beholden to it or mired by it. This is how Han envisions redemption, and by extension, the goal of revolution. Citing Jeremiah, he writes, No longer will a man teach his neighbor, or a man his brother, to say, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. And then citing Isaiah, They will neither harm nor destroy, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. Chin continues, It is not just that one man will no longer enjoy a material advantage over another, that advantage which is essentially the result of violence. Even the spiritual advantage of one man over another will be negated. The distinction between great and small, strong and weak, shall not be, not just materially, but also in spirit. For it is advantage that constitutes the foundation of the rule of one man over another. Each individual is the absolute and sole master of his eye. No eye bends to the authority of another eye. Every individual is his own master. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.